welcome to the Avenue Church. We are glad you are here. Team, thank you for your uh, leadership this morning. Uh, we're excited to continue and actually uh, bring to conclusion our series called the All In Series. It's our strategy for uh, 2018 and beyond. This will be the final installment of that. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, just a couple of things we wanted to bring to your attention. First of all, our first onboarding class uh, will be today after service. Onboarding um, is our pathway to membership, but it's also uh, just a great way for you to take a next step here at the Avenue Church. If you kind of are thinking, hey, I want to make this church my home, this is, this is what, what I want to be my church family, then onboarding is the class for you. It'll be five weeks after service for about an hour, 11.30, right in the room that's kind of directly behind that wall. If you go through those exit signs and take a right, where most of our people take uh, a straight to go get their kids, you take a right, and uh, we'll be down that hallway in the classroom. We'll be eating today and uh, talking about an intro to the AC, and then you're gonna hear from different voices that talk to you about different topics, relationships, redemption, uh, DNAs, all sorts of things. And so uh, we, we're excited to be uh, giving our first offering of onboarding. And uh, you definitely uh, don't want to miss it. Just be equipped uh, to what it means to be here at the Avenue Church. And then lastly, um, on uh, May 12th, can you believe it's almost May? It's like, wow, that means summer is right around the corner. I know some of you are like on a countdown mode, whether you're a student or you're in education. I'm not saying that's a bad thing because I was in ed education at one point too. And there's certain things to be excited about. And the summer is one of those things. And um, so what we're going to do on May 12th, which is a Saturday, um, we're actually going to join another uh, church, Trinity Church. And uh, they have sort of a church and a school event that they're doing uh, down at uh, Quiet Waters, uh, which is, uh, it's kind of, uh, they, ha they have different things to do at Quiet Waters Park, but one of the things that they're doing is they're going to be gathering near the Ski Rickson. If you don't know what a Ski Rickson is, it's basically this thing that allows you to do water skiing stuff without a boat. And, uh, and so we're, we're going to be joining together and we're going to have what's called Summer Fest. Summer Fest. So if you'd like to celebrate things early, Come on May 12th and join us and join Trinity as we as we gather together and collaborate uh, for, for an awesome celebration. Hey, so I have a story that I want to tell you guys about school. I'm going to start off with a story, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll just be, be very uh, direct. It's not my story, but it's going to help us uh, in our time today as we look at the power of the better story. Hey, so uh, if you have your Bibles, it comes from Acts 22, and this is how it goes. This is the Apostle Paul. It's his story. I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Sicilia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way, that being Christians, to death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them, I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were with, who were there, and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, about noon, a great light from heaven shone around me. And I fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me, and I came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me, and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. 
And at that very hour, I received my sight and I saw. And he said to me, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and what you have heard. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. The story sort of concludes a few verses down with Paul being sent specifically to the Gentiles. To the Gentiles. You guys know who Bart uh, Millard is? Bart Millard? I'm not even sure how to pronounce his last name. But do you know what I'm talking about? This guy named Bart um, didn't understand his gifting. Didn't really understand kind of what God had given him. See, Bart was a football player. He was just kind of like a big dude doing his football thing, working out, trying to pursue that career um, until he came upon an unfortunate injury, knocked him out, and it forced him to join some extracurricular uh, things, specifically the, um, I don't know if it was the glee club or like a, like a singing club, a, t a team of, of singers, a choir, if, if if you'll call it that. And uh, he, he wasn't really down for doing it. Um, and so he decided to do what he thought he would be good at, which is uh, backstage stuff and, um, you know, kind of be a part of a helping hand. Until one day, he happened to just be singing in an auditorium, much like this. And the, the coach or the, I'm an athletic guy, so I, the teacher or the person who leads that team came in and heard Bart singing and was like, man, you, you got a gift. You've got to explore that gift. And he's like, no, 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 no. And the story unfolds that she basically forced him in a loving way into a place where he started using that gift. And as the story unfolds, became the lead singer of Mercy Me and produced one of the most famous of all Christian songs in Christian radio today. I can only imagine. You see, the thing about Bart is he was uniquely and deeply talented, but he had no idea. Man, I think that's how some of us are living today as it pertains to this really unique and rich gift that you have that maybe you've never used. It's called your story. Your story. Each and every one of us has an amazing story of God's grace where he has pursued you and captured you and called you his own if you are a follower of Christ. And what I'm here to tell you today is as we look at scripture and, and as we uh, explore this, my hope and my prayer is that you will realize that you had this tool sort of like in your, in your back, um, you know, like quiver if you will. You know those movies, Lord of the Rings, and, and, and all those sort of Chronicles of Narnia, where the, the really um, awesome, heroic people, they seem to have weapons in their back. It's like Legolas, or whoever, and, and you know, like they pull them out, and, like, and, and then it's go time. You can even see westerns like that. When it's a really cool western, the guy has like two shotguns, and he's like, you know, it's like, oh, I didn't even know, oh, you have that there? I'm, I'm okay, you win. I want you to walk out of here today because God encountered you in such a way that you have this new confidence as you walk out the door to say, whoosh, as it pertains to evangelism, I have a weapon I've never used and now I know how to use it. You don't have to be Billy Graham. You don't have to be John O'Brien. You don't have to be whoever it is that you elevate and think, man, they really know the scriptures. They really know how to preach and throw it down. You just need to know your story. Because I believe as Paul did, and the blind guy that Jesus healed, and many who walk through the world of recovery, that there is power in your story that is probably untapped both for you and the people around you. So I want to encourage you to tell your story. Become the better storyteller. That's who Paul was. As we, as we finish up our series, Reimagining Evangelism, a brief definition here will, will get us, uh, keep us going. We're thinking about evangelism in a different way, and here's how we're defining it. Becoming relationally relevant in the loving demonstration and declaration of the gospel. We've 
We've talked about what it means to build relationships with people who might be far from God. Jesus. They might be disenfranchised with the, his church. They might have pains. They might not. Everything might be going awesome and they might not see any need for this stuff. We've talked about some of the ways where, where you can be equipped to pursue those people in relevant and loving ways. Um, today, this is, a, this is a bit more of the declaration side. I think it was two Sundays ago we walked through the gospel. And we said these are the components of the bad news. These are the components of the good news. This is how you invite somebody to meet Jesus as Lord and Savior. And, and we just we did some teaching on like, here is what the gospel is. So that you would actually know when you find yourself in those situations, what it means to help somebody to understand themselves as a sinner without hope yeah. besides, bless you, besides, besides that, was, that was well time. I was right between the bad news and the good news. That was awesome. A sinner without hope, comma, outside of the grace of God. Outside of the grace of God. That there would be a God who loved you enough to send his son and die in your place. Your sin upon him, him crushed in your place so that that perfect and holy and righteous God could look at you and say, I can in all integrity forgive you, Casey, because I've already punished and crushed my son on your behalf. He's overcome your sin. He's overcome your death because he's right next to me. Like he's alive. So what that means is that if you'll accept my grace by simply turning from sin and self and, and your own chaos and receive my love, my gift of Christ crucified and resurrected. Man, if you just receive that and come after me by faith, I mean, it's all faith. It's saying, I quit on me and, I, and I'm saying yes to you, Jesus, as both my Savior and, and my Master. Like, I'm, here I am. I, by faith, I'm believing you're the better way. You come after God's gift that way. You receive it. You receive forgiveness. You receive new life and adoption. We spent a whole Sunday talking about how if you want to like really go through the in-depth pieces of that, you can. Today, we're going to talk about how does that fit in your story? How does God's story and your story come together so that if, you, if you're not like super comfortable as like a Bible, you like you think you might forget this or that, just learning how to tell your story will actually be telling the story of Jesus' love in your life and be super, super beautiful. So we're going we're gonna to walk our way through Acts 2, and then, man, I've got a surprise for you that I think is going to be super awesome, um, and, and I want to I kind of get there. So, hey, uh, Acts 22, Paul tells his story with four elements that we want to help you guys to learn how to tell your story with. They're in your handout, so the handouts are, are meant for you to take and, and to look at throughout the week and to practice. You know, some of these things are practice. And so you're going to see four elements there on your handout to telling your story. Now, if you're not a believer, that's totally cool. You're welcome. We want to listen. We want to be a place where you can belong here before you believe. Like, you can check it out. It's safe. You can ask questions. You can doubt. You can push back. Like, that, that's seemingly how Jesus did his thing. And so that we want to do, we want to do the same thing. So if you're not a believer, that's totally cool. If you too have a story, it's just going to have a different solution to it right now. And we just invite you every week to the solution of Jesus Christ. But if he has become your solution, then these elements might, uh, they might fit uh, a little bit better in your story and they might make a little bit sense. But it's helpful for you to have some handles as you start telling your story to somebody so that Jesus can remain the hero and you can remain secondary. Because we're all really good at being heroic on our own, are we not? We just prone toward that. No matter how sick, no matter how much we're suffering, no matter how broken we are, no matter how much we've tasted the grace of God, we always still have this prone heart that wanders back to us being the hero. What we want to help us today is walk through how does Jesus remain the hero? And so there's four elements here in Paul's story that are also part of your story. And there's some blanks there if you want to jot some like names and figures and notes down as we go through it. But I would encourage you to also do that um, this evening or this afternoon as you, as you get home with, with this material. So like any good story, there's, there's like an intro, there's a problem, there's a solution, and then there's a conclusion. Um, uh, uh, real quick, real quick, real quick. What's your favorite movie? I want you to shout it out on the count of three. One, two, three, go. <laughs> All right, I don't know if anybody said mine, so I'll just say mine. Who's yours? Who's yours? Oh. Oh. So you might have a favorite individual movie. Now, and I need you to think again. You should think again. 
What's your favorite movie that was turned into like a super long series where they did a movie here, a movie two years later, a movie here, and like maybe they're still even doing movies today? Think about it. Maybe, maybe you're a, like a, a Frodo guy. Maybe you're like all into the baggots, and that's your thing, and you know that. Or, or maybe, again, chronically, you're Aslan. Like, you're an Aslan fan, you got the lion poster, you come and you have to explain it to people, because it's kind of scary. Uh, maybe, maybe you're, you're a, like a Rocky Balboa, like, you know, tough Philly guy, man, just making his way up. I had to do that, because the Sixers, the Sixers are finally good again, okay? So I'm throwing out a bone to my Philly fans. Okay, I see you, I see you back there. Okay, or maybe, Maybe you're a Star Wars fan and you're gonna die before they wrap it up. Because <laughs> Disney bought it and they're just gonna keep making movie after movie after movie. But here's what you know about those movies. There's usually um, an intro that, that kind of like um, sets up the what's going on. There, there's, there's an intro that kind of gives you an idea. It's, we might call it the setting. And, and then there's usually a plot that requires some fixing. It gets a bit dramatic in the midst of the plot. And then, and then there's usually a moment. Like the moment when things happen and, and everything gets turned upside down and, and usually good uh, conquers evil and then there's usually a conclusion sort of how things get wrapped up and an after story you know and it says hey and this person grew up and became this and you you know you stay towards the end right like i'm never leaving those movies I'm like i gotta find out what happened with this person i know it's coming i know there's credits now new people are coming in but i know there's got to be an after story i love the after story it's like i gotta find out what happens forever well, each of us have that kind of story, where we have sort of beginning, problem, solution, and then conclusion. We're just going to look at Paul's, and, and then I'm going to get this as a surprise. All right, here we go. So Paul's, uh, if, if you, you have the Bible, or you just want to take some notes here, it's, it's on your outline. Verse 3, Paul gives you his intro. Here's his intro. He says, I am, and then he introduces himself. I am born in, he talks about that, I was brought up here and educated here, and I was zealous for this. This all pretty much comes out in verse uh, 3. And so what is he doing? He's giving you the setting of his life. He's giving you basic character information about who he is that will help you to understand his story. If you were to look at the story of God, because, watch, check this. This, this whole, this is one story. It's not like 66 mini stories. This is one story. And it has the same chapters. The chapters of this story go like this. Creation, everything good. Fall, everything broken. Redemption, Jesus enters the brokenness. Rescues, and then renewal. One day Jesus comes back and renews all things. Okay, our stories have the same chapter. And when we start to learn to tell them under the themes of, of like how the scripture tells its story, man, powerful thing happens. And so this is sort of the creation portion of Paul's story, if you will. He's, he's telling you kind of how he started. Because if you know anything about your story, you know that you are still a direct product of your home. Whether it was good or bad. Whether it was abusive or encouraging and super healthy. In this world, no matter how much redemption you've experienced, you are still part of that story. It doesn't have to define you. It doesn't have to be the loudest part, but, but you can't pretend like you're completely divorced of your parents or lack thereof. You can't pretend, like all of that stuff in your formative years is a big part of your story. I mean, Paul talks about his heritage as well. And so as you think about telling your story, you'll see that you're kind of like on your ally, here's your blank. What, what's your intro blank? What was your, I don't know, first 10, 12 years like? Was it a healthy home? Was it a difficult home? What was, what was important in your home? Was it, uh, was it together? Was it broken? Um, did you experience good things? Did you experience abusive things? Did you experience, um, are you disillusioned with what you experienced? It's just a, a, an invitation to think a little bit about your beginning because your beginning sets up for other people like what God's been doing now. And so we can't just skip that. I was thinking about my beginning. My beginning was, it was like really super healthy. We grew up in a home and we went to church and we, and we did all those sort of things. And, and, and some of the things that were like main themes of my beginning were family, um, church, and athletics. That was kind of, and I, I don't know the priority. It probably switched on, on those back and forth, things like that. But, but that's kind of, if you see me now, you can probably see strong links to each of those. And I, it's just kind of part of who God's made me to be, and it was part of my experience, but it's not the end. 
So then there's a problem, right? Look at, look at number two, chapter two, if you will. Um, this would be considered like the fall in the creation uh, uh, narrative. And the problem Paul um, talks about in verses four and five, he says, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women. And so Paul talks about sort of the chaos that ensued before Jesus came in and started to rearrange his life. Paul talks about, I'm going to say that again, the chaos that ensued before Jesus came in, he didn't, he didn't make him like, like, he didn't relieve him of all sin. He didn't make him perfect Paul. He just began to reorder and reorient his life around a much greater and more loving cause slash person. So what was life like? What was some of that stuff like before Jesus came in and started to rework your, your life? Well, talk about some of that. And so, so um, for me, this would be kind of like the plot where you start to realize, man, I could sure use a better party right about now. For me, um, and, and if you're new here, you're like, what is he talking about? <laughs> uh, we've been talking a lot about how the kingdom of God and the person of Jesus Christ, they're like, they're like the better party. And he keeps inviting all people to the better party. And so for me, I started to realize in my chaos that as I look back now, I, I couldn't have voiced it at the time, but I started to realize that like my idols weren't working as well as they used to. Does anybody, can anybody relate to that? Like the things that I held on to specifically for security, family, sports, church, like relationships, those sort of things, they, they didn't like quiet my restlessness. And I lived in this like minor chaos that I tried to mask and hide, um, but I didn't even know how to really explain it. I mean, I was like 12 and 13, and like I came to a, a place in my of faith early when I was 13. But like, what I do know as I look back is like my idols that I thought could sustain me, they just quit working as well as I thought they would. And, and when your idols quit working as well as you thought they would, it usually leads you into chaos. For me, it's anxiousness. I don't know what it is. For but you probably have your story as well. Uh, number three is solution. So um, Paul talks about his solution, verses 6 through 16. He says, as I was on my way to Damascus, boom, Jesus. <laughs> we can go into the details, but it was just like, um, sometimes Jesus wins you over a time, and sometimes Jesus just drops the mic on you. And, and he just like interrupts your life. He's like, I'm here. Let's do this. That's not what it was like for me, but that's what it was like for Paul. He's running one way. Jesus just interrupts him and is like, <clears throat> I'd like to introduce myself. I'm going to go ahead and blind you. And then I'm going to heal you. And then I'm going to help you to know what to do next. Paul's story was very dramatic. Mine was more like relationally, build, 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 things like that. But there's, there's a time that where, where Jesus becomes the solution of your story, if he actually is the solution of your story. There's a time when he was not, and there's a time when he was. Nobody is a life, career Christian. You were not born a Christian. You were born outside of God, and there was a time, because of our sin nature, there was a time when God rescued you from that by giving you faith in his finished work in Christ. You might not be super clear as to when that was, or maybe it's a process, that's okay. But you, you need, as you tell your story, you need to think about what was going on during that time where I started to learn that there was a better party going on than just me. That I started to look to Jesus specifically as my new treasure and my master. As things in my life started to change. If you'll notice, when you start to see Paul coming to the solution of his life, he asks the, the, the light or the person, what now shall I do? Not what belief do I need to sign off on. Paul now had a new belief, but because that belief was real and genuine, it actually had action that followed it. It's like, dude, whoever you are, I'm now ready to follow you because I believe you are who you say you are. I and mean, that's, that's what faith looks like. An increasing willingness to ask Jesus, what do you want me to do? And so in, in the solution aspect here, um, we see that he comes across a guy named Ananias. And that's a guy who comes over and prays for him. And, and the, the things fall off his eyes and he's able to see again. And Paul learns a little bit about his identity, that he's going to be a witness. He's going to tell a lot of people about Jesus. He needs to be baptized. 
and he needs to call on the name of Jesus. There's some specific stuff that Paul does. So when Paul's talking about the solution, it's not just like, oh yeah, I met Jesus, and, and, and then he goes on. He's like, no, no, here's what happened. I had this major trauma, I had this major issue, and then Jesus entered into it, but he entered into it with another person named Ananias. And then Ananias helped me when nobody else would. And then I began to understand some more things, and, and, and I got baptized, and I called on the name of Jesus. So, so there's, a, there's like a, uh, some events that follow Paul's solution. What about you guys? This is sort of the moment. In your life, what, what, so, what are some of the things that, that um, surrounded that moment? I put it on your outline, is how did you begin to look to Jesus as your treasure and your master and your better party. For me, as I told you before, my idols were failing. I was in a church where they preached the gospel every week. I went to an onboarding class that they didn't call onboarding, but that's what I did because my parents made me when I was 13 years old. And in the course of that nine week class, I was like, oh, that gospel's for me. Okay, cool. A lot of different people, a lot of involvement around my solution wasn't just me and Jesus sort of over here. And then finally, the conclusion. Verse 21, um, go for I will send you away to the Gentiles. And so this is where we get to see uh, the after story. What is happening now because of the resolution? So because of Jesus in Paul's life, he now is being sent to the Gentiles. There's a specific nature to what God is doing in his life that's happening right now because Jesus became the solution back then and continues to be the solution today. And so um, for you, how has your, real simple, how has your life been changing because of Jesus? What does that look like for you? So it's not just that I got saved as a 13 year old. So today, watch this, today, because of Jesus, like totally because of Jesus, I'm able to look at my wife and not hold her up to a performance task that, that I hold people and myself up to. Because of Jesus, I'm able to have a heart for kids that don't look like me or have their last name. Now they do at least have the last name as me. Just adopted some kids here a couple months ago, about a month ago. I'm, Thank yeah, you. Oh, awesome. Bless the parents. I'm able to walk forward in the midst of some of the old chaos that calls my name and not be dominated, actually be present and available to you even in the midst of some of the old storms that still call my name. I'm able to do that stuff. And it's not, I hope that like the applause is for us. The applause is because Jesus has been changing my heart that way. That's stuff that Jesus has been doing currently in my marriage, in my home, and in my personal life. But like he's continuing to renew me. It's the after story and it's going on now. And one day, it'll be made perfect. But for right now, dude, I would love to tell you more and more and more about what Jesus has been doing today in my life. It's part of my story. And so, um, so let's, let's do the surprise. Is that cool? Is that cool? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so I asked, um, I asked uh, two people to come up on, on stage, and, and you're going to get to hear a little bit about their stories. You know, a little less talk from me, a little more like, let's lab it out and see how this works. So if Jennifer and Travis are here, can you guys come on up and give them a hand, please? You look beautiful too. Oh man, I feel like, you know, this is like awesome. Hello to our online crowd. I hope you guys are really enjoying this. This would be a great time to share this moment. If some people are like not down with church, but they're down with hearing people's story, share it now. Go to our app. You can, you can like watch it live, share it, or encourage somebody to do that. Um, but yeah, this is gonna be great. Um, so here's what I asked them to do. I asked them to basically tell their story in chapter form. Um, at, and, and so that we can see what this might look like. So normally you wouldn't like tell a chapter of your story and then wait for somebody else to tell their chapter. Okay, that's, nobody does that, but we do, okay? And so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna ask them sort of the chapter one question, they'll both answer, and then we'll go to chapter two, chapter three, chapter four. And so we wanna demonstrate uh, what this can look like for you with people who love Jesus and like, you know, they're pre they knew about the questions coming into Sunday, but they can spend years preparing it, they just lived it. It's your story. So, um, does somebody want to start? All right. I'll start. So, Travis, the first question, I'm going to cue them, cue them in on some, on some questions. Um, Travis and Jennifer are both members here. They've both been here for years. That may come out in their story. I don't, I don't want to steal it thunder. Um, but, like, we, we love them dearly. 
both of them. And uh, we love what the Lord's done in their life. And so we just want to kind of explore that with you guys. So Chavis, um, as I'm even just using the handout here, it, your intro, if you will, what kind of start, you know, upbringing, stuff like that did you have? Well, my name's Travis, like Casey said. Um, I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. My start, um, to be honest, there wasn't a lot of church involved. I, I, um, I'd heard of God, obviously, um, like most people have. Um, I grew up in a very poor uh, family, and um, to be honest with you, uh, my only experience in church was there was a Sunday school uh, bus that came around once or twice, I believe, and my mom allowed them to take us to church, and I liked it. We got to do some crafts, and I thought it was fun, but um, it was never really um, a big part of my life early on, and uh, so there wasn't a lot of experience with church other than you know, we would we would sometimes pray the you know the, the, the Christmas dinner and the Thanksgiving dinner, um, but there there just wasn't a lot of foundation. Uh, what I know to be foundation now, um, so that's basically my beginning. Yeah. yeah. So so not opposed to it, open to it, but not like really for it. For it. Oh, absolutely. I just don't uh, remember. Uh, I definitely did not go to church a lot. I think two times. Yeah. To be honest with you. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, man. How about your beginning, Jennifer? Hi, everybody. I'm Jennifer Menard. Um, for me, my beginning, I grew up in the church when I was little. Um, my dad was a pastor, um, so it was church, 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 every Sunday. I was in every activity you can think of, Bible study, Sunday school, uh, the dance, choir. I had to be in everything. Um, so for me, I was surrounded by church, and I kind of got like overwhelmed with it. Um, it was a very sheltered home, safe home. I had a mom, a dad, siblings, extended uh, family. Um, we couldn't sleep over at friends' house. We couldn't go to parties or anything like that. It was just very sheltered, tight knit fam, and it was just home, school, church. So I grew up like that. So you had a, it was intense. Like it was it was intense. Yes. yes. Okay. All right. All right. I may have you talk to Paul and Caroline. Oh, and I was called PK Kid growing up, and for those who don't know that, that's Pastor Kid, so we were put on this pedal stool, we had to be perfect, that image, so, okay. yeah. Okay, we got it. All right, so those are the intros, so now you kind of have an idea of where they're coming from. So, Travis, uh, over to you, talk, talk to us a little bit about, like, the problem, or, you know, this is where, this would be kind of like the plot of his life. What was life like before Jesus came in and started to reorder you? Well, for me, I mean, it's a long story, but I'll try to shorten it. Um, ultimately, I ended up becoming a professional wrestler and uh, um, was on the road 300 days a year with WWE, and uh, it was a very dirty life, to be honest. Um, developed a, a heavy prescription pill problem, and uh, although I still, I'll get to it in a minute, but in the back of my head, my dad died around the time, the beginning of my story, about 11 years old, and I always thought in the back of my head, I kept hearing, sorry, my dad's voice in my head, but um, what I found out later on after coming to Christ, I really believe that was Jesus, but I know that just came out, but my point to saying that was, most of this, my adult uh, life was just a dirty life, and as I look back on it, a lot of shame, a lot of guilt, being away from uh, everyone, living in a hotel room, um, and again, uh, a really hard uh, prescription pill problem. Mm. So man, you're like, you're almost um, like experiencing some of the things that life might say success is, but it's leading you to places of darkness. Absolutely, I think on the surface, everybody would say, uh, that's amazing, you know, you're famous, you're on television every week, and, uh, money's not a problem, but for me, uh, it was a, it was a miserable life, a really miserable life. I didn't have any um, hope. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I appreciate that. And Jennifer, how about you? What was what was it like before Jesus really got a hold of you and started to, to reorder who you are? Uh, for me, <clears throat> I was very prideful. Um, I was that the stereotype Christian that people from the outside would say that you judge judgmental and always comparing and 
always thinking that you're better than the other person. So I had that type of uh, personality uh, growing up. And it was difficult for me to make friends because people didn't want to be near someone like that who called themselves a Christian and, you know, and then put the person down next to them saying I'm better than you. Like, no one wants to be near someone like that. Um, so, I, you know, I didn't have that much friends. And um, it was difficult to have relationships. And, um, and I just got tired of it, of just living that, trying to be perfect. So one day I just said, you know what? I'm just going to turn my back from God and do my own thing, take control of my own life, and just go out there and do whatever I want. So I decided to do that, and um, I've faced a lot of consequences. Thank you for sharing that. For sharing that honesty. So, so far you can see we've got, we've got two different stories going on. We've got one that just geared himself toward the world and with reckless abandon, like, that was it. And then we had another who was, like, in what we might call a religious trap, right? Where it was, like, all about pride and performance and stuff like that. And, um, it wore you out so much that you just said, I'm out of here. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, Travis, talk to us a little bit about solutions and, and uh, what was it like um, for you what were some of the events and people maybe that, that helped you to, to come from that place of darkness to where Jesus started to be got, be, become the center of your life? So it culminated um, with one of the many injuries I've had and um, just everything come crashing down. A lot of my friends were dying around me and um, the real breaking point was I've, I had a lot of addiction in my family. My dad died, I didn't mention it, but he died of systematic alcohol abuse. And uh, I found my mom dead of an overdose, and this was, you know, later on in my life. And it was ultimately the thing that um, just drove me over the cliff, if you will. So at that point, I, um, you know, I got really bad. I was, uh, you know, went into a rehab program. And um, it, it, for those in recovery, you, you have to find a power greater than yourself. And I knew of one, uh, Jesus Christ. So I, I latched onto that. Uh, I moved here to Delray Beach. I came to the Avenue Church, and one of my roommates said, hey, we're going to church, would you like to go today? I came, that's probably been five or six years, or five years ago maybe, and um, that was the start. I, I didn't go regularly, ended up meeting my then, uh, my now wife, and she said the same thing to me, hey, I think we need to start going to church, and we kind of reorganized our life around that, and um, I just got to know a guy named John O'Brien, and um, through that, um, I've been here ever since. Yeah. So you, so for you, it was there was one kind of catalytic event, but then it was like a process of meeting this person named Jesus, who was through your, you know, your now wife. I married them, by the way. Awesome. That was really cool. That was a cool moment. Um, it was. Thank you. You're welcome. Of course, of course. Um, I can remember when he first came to church. You know, like I'm like, okay. That dude's big and he, and he doesn't say much. That's all right. That's cool. I like, wonder who he is. And, uh, and then I got to know you, you know, through a similar process of probably how you got to know Jesus. You know, we had some people introduce us and, and, then, and then we spent some time together. And, and so it was during that time, so you had a faith community and you had a couple of key relationships that helped you to understand your need for someone greater named Jesus. Absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. Now, how about you, Jennifer? Um, for me, um, it all started with a member here at this church. Her name is Mary Jane Smith. Um, she mentored me um, through my rough season, and um, she just kept telling me, hey, I need you to check this church out. Um, they have something called Redemption Group. I was like, oh, what is that? And she's like, trust me, just come. I was like, okay, fine. So I went. And then I was like, oh my God, what is this? Like all these broken people just like me, they came as, you know, come as you are and everyone crying and, you know, pouring out their heart. And I was like, what? And then that was like the first time I actually felt hurt. Like other, like growing up, no one ever heard my story or my situation or my problems. And just coming to Redemption Group, it was just like life changing. And then I was like, who are these people? They're like, oh, they go to the Avenue Church. And I was like, okay, I need to be surrounded by people like this. 
then I came to the Avenue Church and then became a member, and then I was just like, wow. And then going through other classes like uh, Sacred Search and uh, Boundaries with Liz and Jerry, I learned active listening skills and all these other resources that I felt like, you know, helped me to be more relational, more open, more vulnerable, and uh, to love upon others. It's just, that was just where it started there. That's, so. I hope I answered that right. You did. You killed it. Oh, yeah, you all did. right. Because I can... Yeah, you did. Okay. So again, we see some similar patterns here in that in that progression, right? A few individual people, Mary Jane Smith, and maybe like your redemption leader or whatever along the way, but then uh, a community of faith that allowed you to belong just as you were. And I think for Jenny, as she's speaking, because I, I have a similar thing, stories, um, I knew about Jesus, I just didn't know Jesus. You know, and I'm not, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like there's a little bit of like that progression going on, and, and that, that can be really painful too. Yeah, for like, growing up, I've heard about the gospel, but that was the turning point about four years ago, when God said that, you know, Jesus said, come, come to me, just like that. Like, I stepped away from him, and God knows what I did, and I realized I couldn't do it, and he rescued me and said, come. And that's when I knew what the gospel was. And I grew up in church. Yeah. That killed me. Yeah. That growing up, I didn't even figure that out until four years ago. Yeah. And I'm 28. Mm. Still learning that, too. Oh, man, I'm a lot older than 28. <laughs> 23. Um, I'm going to ask you a feelings question right now, and then we'll get to the last question. But what did it feel like, and I'll go, like, stay in this moment here with you. What did it feel like to actually experience the love of God in that way? Finally. Mm. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Chad, what did it feel like? Um, safe. I think for the first time in my life, I felt safe um, and trust, and it was going to be okay. There was going to be problems, but it was going to be okay. That's, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Travis, we'll, we'll finish. Here, you can start us on our last chapter, and this is the uh, the chapter where we call it the conclusion, if you will, although it's an ongoing process, but how has, how has Jesus lately been at work in your life? What are some of the things he's been doing or changing sort of from the inside out? Um, I, I just feel truly blessed, and, I, and I've just tried to lead a life um, as, as close as I can to the gospel, um, which is an impossible task, and I know that. I'm a sinner, and I sin every day. Um, um, some days worse than others, but for me and my wife, we were able to start some businesses here in Delray. I think we've impacted a lot of people's lives, both our employees and the people that come to our businesses, um, just by walking um, in this life, in this, um, in this light, this newfound light, this, this passion I have for life now. Um, in fact, that's our company saying, passion for life because I really have a passion for life now. I, I, I felt, um, like I said before, I was, I was reckless to say the least, and now I, at least I have a target, um, a target of peace that I can try to find in Jesus. Yeah, that's so good. So, so I mean, it sounds like the kingdom of God has so come upon your, your life and, and the life of your wife that everything you now do reflects that. And if, you, if you're a part of the uh, pure Life or Pure Green, some of the businesses he started, if you're a part of that as an employee or you go and you work out, like you know there's something different there. And this story is very specific as to why. That's a different place than probably any other place you've ever been. That's really cool to see. How about you? How, how has the Lord just continued his, his good work in your life? Jennifer? Well, first of all, he's definitely softening my heart. It was I had a lot of like shame and guilt, and it was my heart was very hardened uh, towards everyone. So he definitely worked in that in my life, and just like showing love, more love and grace, because I I felt like I didn't give that, um, I didn't receive that, and I didn't give that, and 
he showed me that, so I just feel like anyone I encounter, like work, school, church, anyone, I just want to give that. I missed out in, that in the beginning. Um, and uh, like just people who are just going through, like I, people who I would encounter, I'm more open to stepping out, reaching out to them and talking to them because you never know, that person might need to hear about Jesus. So I think God's like definitely working in that in my life right now. So he took a, a heart that you described as prideful, or scriptures might even say cold, and he warmed it. And But he didn't just warm up for you, using your words, it, it now goes out to everyone that you come in contact with. As much as I can, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's so good, a missionary on mission with the love of Jesus. That's a super dangerous and powerful thing. And I love it, and, and it's so cool to see that um, really revolutionize our world today in our city. So, thanks for thanks for sharing. Can we give both of them a, a round of applause? Yeah. So as you can see, we like we're not not playing any games here. This is real, um, and that's. Because Jesus is real, and the gospel changes lives forever. Uh, our team's going to come up, and we're going to play. And I, I've never asked—I don't think I've ever asked anybody to stand behind me as I make the concluding comments. But I feel like you need to see them. Not that it's hard to see Travis behind me. <laughs> you need to see them as I tell you what I think Jesus wants you to hear, and then we're going to sing. And then we're going to have prayer partners come, like we always do. And if you don't have a story like this, because you haven't come to that solution of Jesus, listen, like, there's no need to wait. You heard what Jenny said. It's, it's safe to come. Some of you need to say, finally. Some of you need to have that experience with Travis where, man, you are just at the end of another dark cul-de-sac. But there's more. Man, I promise you, with all that I am, and I give my life for this, there is more than where you are. So you'll see some people up here. Just come and let them pray over you. Tell them you want that more. You realize, that, yeah, I'm broken. This is my mess, but I need Jesus to come in. Re Recenter me. Renew this heart. Give me something new that only he can give you through his death and resurrection. Here's what I want to say as, you, as we close and we think about telling our story. First of all, the better story is told in the language of the audience. All of you could understand Jennifer. All of you could understand Travis. The reason why is because we have up here the older brother and the younger brother from the prodigal. We all fit in, in one of these two categories. Either we're trying to break all the rules and run as far away from God as we can and find life that way, or we're trying to keep all the rules. And we find ourselves prideful and exhausted and miserable. Both leave you miserable. But as you tell your story, make sure you know who your audience is. Paul in this chapter says he spoke in Hebrew because his audience was Hebrew at that time. Know who your audience is and speak in a way that they can understand. I don't think you heard a lot of big, high, churchy words, did you? Justification, adoption, ex expiation. No, no, no. They just like, man, this is where I was, this is who Jesus became, and this is where I am now. Secondly, the better story is told with Jesus as the hero. I hope it's really clear that you're not walking out of here thinking like, yay, Travis, man, I gotta get this dude's autograph. Or Jennifer, oh my goodness, I gotta have her in my study because she... No, they're, they're just, just broken people like, like myself. But at the center of their story is this person named Jesus that they are, <laughs> they would love for you to meet. His whole story points to Jesus. Her whole story points to Jesus. They are not who they are without Jesus. So remember, as you tell your story, even if you had more time to get into some of the details of the before or the after, make sure that people understand this is a Jesus thing. This is not a me thing. 
This is a Jesus thing. Jesus did this. If you like the way my marriage looks or my family or this or that, it's because Jesus, because without Jesus, I would go so quickly back to being self-absorbed. Shallow, insecure person that I used to be. Jesus rescues me from that. And he rescues you from the same thing. And then finally, man, some of you might struggle with this, and this is where we'll, we'll end. Like, tell your story with great confidence in the author. Tell your story with great confidence in the author. Some of you may not think, dude, I didn't wrestle in the WWE. You know, like, I only made, like, AAA, whatever WWE might exist. <laughs> My story doesn't have those details. My story is not like people didn't know me. And so, you know, I grew up in the church. And, and so, like, who wants to hear my? That might be you because that can be me at times. When we start comparing stories and we start thinking like, oh, man, I don't know if my story is going to have the same mm, as this person's story. Let me tell you something. This girl right here was dead. She was dead. She was outside of the love of God. She had no hope or no future for today. She was miserable, and she had an eternity of misery awaiting her. She was a flatline, spiritually dead person. And the person of Jesus Christ, through the work of the Holy Spirit, rose her up just like he was resurrected on Easter morning. It's just that she doesn't have a new body yet. She will. She will when he comes back. This is a life that was dead. This is a life that was dead. Have great confidence in the author of your story. It will wow because he wows. Father, as we transition to song, I thank you that these stories are real, that these stories bring your story to life. And I pray that if there was somebody here who doesn't know you, as their better party, as the center of their story, that they might even come forward during this time and surrender themselves to you, the great treasure of all stories. Lord, I pray your favor and your anointing and your blessing over Jennifer and over Travis, that you might continue to use them to turn this world upside down with your love and your grace and your mercy. Amen. Amen. If you don't know who the Holy Spirit is, that's what you're experiencing right now. I just, I wanted to leave back there and come with you. I was watching and I was like, the Spirit is just here today. It's thick, it's rich. He is with us. And the Spirit's number one job is to make a big deal out of Jesus. Here's how we're going to end. I'm going to pray a benediction over you, which is a promise for believers and for those who want to come and receive that promise through Christ. It could be your promise too. We'll have our prayer partners stay for a little bit. Some music will happen. Onboarding class, if you're coming to that, will be starting at 11.30. But if you just need to kind of sit in this moment for a second, we want to make it comfortable for that. We'll keep the lights at about this level of... Like I said, you hear a little bit of music. Maybe you just need to sit there. Maybe you need to come forward for some prayer, whatever it is. You never want to rush out of the Holy Spirit moments. Receive this benediction. Now may the great God of the greatest story ever being told, may he make his face to shine upon you. May he give you his peace and his love and his grace to make him great, great storytellers. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Love you guys. Amen.